so now on to our speaker. Uh, as you all know, the first priority at DSHS in the um, one department framework is the development of behavioral and primary health care integration through person-centered health care homes. Barbara has been a, a proponent of this for some time, an acknowledged expert nationally, certainly well known in our state. Um, we have her with us to help us build and, and achieve a common uh, knowledge base around what we mean by person-centered health homes and how we should go about and think about the integration of care. Uh, also want to mention that the transformation grant, the mental health transformation grant has generously provided support uh, to us so that we could bring Barbara for this training and for last month's training. We're very grateful for that as it, I believe, uh, continues to support um, the transformative efforts associated with that grant uh, that's now winding to its close after five years here in the state of Washington. Um, again, Barbara probably no, needs no introduction, but for those who may see this on video, I'm going to go through it formally. Barbara is uh, an MSW and managing consultant for MCPP Consulting, a Seattle firm nationally known for its work in delivery system development. She serves as a senior consultant for the National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care on this subject. She's nationally active in writing, training, and consulting on primary care and behavioral health integration. Prior to her consulting practice, she was senior administrator at Group Health Corporation and also headed the public mental health substance abuse and developmental disabil disability system for King County. As you know, she's co-authored and written many articles on behavioral health care, performance management, and the integration of primary care and behavioral health. With that, I'd like you to welcome Barbara Maurer. Good afternoon, and now let's do one last mic check. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. So uh, welcome back to part two. Uh, you've heard about the transformation grant supporting this. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to have so many people involved in thinking about integration through their support. And that the vision is for safe, healthy individuals, families, and communities uh, that is driving the department's work. So this work fits right inside of that as one of the priorities. And this is part two of, uh, of the training that has been put together. So last time we met, we talked about healthcare reform and parity and how those change the landscape. We also talked about service delivery design and specifically looked at the four quadrant model and some of the relevant research related to the four quadrant model. Today we're going to dive into more details and we'll start by looking at the business case for integration and then at the key elements of integrated care which are clinical, operational, structural, and financial. We'll be talking all, all of those components and at the end of today's session, at the latter part of today's session, We'll be joined by Richard Onizuka, who will be talking with you about Washington State's new payment reform pilots. He's got a very interesting presentation to give you some detail about where Washington is thinking about going. Let me say before we take this dive today that this is, there's a lot of material here. By the time you're finished with me and with Richard, you'll be going, oh, what was that fire hose that you guys just hit me with? This is so much change that you're going to have to spend time with it, talk to your colleagues about it, read some more about it. We're all learning as we go and it's a repetitive process to begin to think about how do all these pieces fit together. So I, I ask you to give yourself some space to just learn what you can learn today and then keep going forward and learning about it. The uh, policy framework that we're going to be developing with a smaller group uh, of your colleagues will be finished in December, and that will be the document that should help 
provide some options and some guidance for the next policy decisions that are being made by the state as it moves forward with health care reform. There are so many opportunities inside of health care reform that we're trying to be poised to move integration forward as a part of those opportunities. And you all, I hope, remember this slide from the last time, which gives us the highest level context, and that is that we want to flip the triangle in terms of the use of resources to increase and have a large foundation, solid foundation of prevention and primary care that sits underneath our overall healthcare system. And as I said last time, what it's gonna to take to get there is it isn't going to happen magically. It's going to take a lot of work on the part of all of the parties to um, move us in that direction by 2014. But today is the day that we start thinking about, okay, how do we move forward towards 2014? And the business case is an important place to start. So the last time I showed you this slide, I pointed out to you that in California, in the fee-for-service medical system, which is structured pretty much like ours is here with the TANF population, mainly in managed care and everybody else in fee-for-service, they looked at the utilization of healthcare resources for the people who had serious mental illness, and that was about 250,000 people. And you will remember that there's a subset of that 250,000 uh, individuals of about 9,500 people who have average health care costs of $50,000 a year. Now, in doing this analysis, they didn't stop with looking at that information. They went deeper into the data. And what they set out to do was to try to understand what was different about the 250,000, the 28,000, and the 9,500 in terms of their utilization of health care costs. What they saw is that there were essentially two pathways, one which they called a relapse population, one which they called a recovery population, and there's a difference of about $1,900 per month in the cost of care between those two populations. So then the next question was, well, that recovery population, what can we see about the way in which they've interacted with the healthcare system that may help us understand what might, can make a difference? So here are the things that they found when they did the analysis of the recovery versus relapse population. First of all, when people were released from the hospital, and remember when you see hospital here, this could be mental health, substance use, healthcare because this is all of those pieces. And most of these individuals had chronic health conditions as well. But rehab mental health services after hospital discharge, that their general practitioner expenses and visit rates went up when there was an exacerbation of whatever chronic condition people had that they had an extended hospital length of stay so that they were actually in the hospital long enough to get a better handle on what was going on with them and to stabilize them before return to the community. Which means then there was a higher ratio of physical to mental health expenditures if you looked at the balance of the financing. They also got inpatient care over ER care. Rather than bouncing in and out of an ER, they were more likely to get admitted and to get assessed on an inpatient basis. And finally, there was um, adherence in terms of psychoactive medications. Then what were the things in the preventive care arena that the re recovery group was more likely to have? It had to do with those factors that are correlated with continued health in any population. Ongoing outpatient phys physician care, flu vaccines, eye exams, ear exams, lipid testing for people with diabetes, and again, adherence to medications. So that brings us to thinking about what the opportunities are for bringing together primary care and mental health and substance use services on the specialty side, where people are receiving their care principally in specialty mental health or substance use. 
And there is not a study on the mental health side that yet shows us what the cost impact might be of doing that, but there is a study on the substance use side. This was a study that was done in Kaiser. It was a randomized controlled trial of their outpatient substance use program in which they placed a primary care clinic. So they integrated primary care into a substance use clinic and they tracked individuals who had what are called substance abuse related medical conditions. And that's that whole long list of little print over on the other side which you can read at your leisure. Um, so one of the first things that they found is that for individuals who receive their, their care, their primary care in an integrated model versus going to their regular uh, Kaiser primary care clinic, they had higher abstinence rates than those who went to their regular primary care doc. And I, I want to make a point of this because this study plus two mental health studies uh, about providing specific attention to primary care for people with serious mental illness show us that when we pay attention to people's physical health condition, we also get results on the mental health and substance use side. People improve on that side as well, which is, is in each of these cases kind of an unexpected result because that wasn't what was being focused on. On the cost side, what we can see here is that they found that for individuals who received the integrated care model, their uh, medical costs decreased from $470 per member per month to $226 per member per month. Uh, a reasonable outcome for the, um, the work that they did, and it is, by the way, in all of this that I'm going to show you about costs, that's net cost after paying for whatever was the, the additional cost of the intervention that was being studied. So let's go on and look at some other things that argue for the business case for integrated care. And we'll start really at the front door of a primary care clinic and think about preventive services that have been recommended by the United States Preventative Ta Services Task Force this study was looking at both the clinically preventable burden and the cost effectiveness of these 25 preventive services. So first finding, alcohol screening and intervention rated at the same level as colorectal cancer screening and hypertension screening and treatment. So we all know, I mean, every time we go into a doctor's office, they put a blood pressure cuff on us, right? That happens every time. Alcohol screening was rated as effective as that. And so that's a big takeaway. And then depression screening was rated at the same level as osteoporosis screening and cholesterol screening and treatment. Now, how many of you are tracking your cholesterol numbers here? Right? Pretty good selection of people who are keeping track of cholesterol numbers. So both of these screenings, depression and alcohol screening, rate at the same level as things that we've come to assume are a part of being healthy and getting health care. More importantly, in the health care reform legislation, there is a provision that says that any of the USPSTF uh, services that rate A or B must be provided as covered services with no copayment associated with it so that there's no cost barrier to people getting any of these services and both alcohol screening and depression screening are in the A and B categories. So that means that there will be hopefully an increased opportunity for people to experience that in primary care. Then let's look at a couple of sites that have had some considerable experience in integrating uh, mental health and or substance use services into primary care. The slight differences in the models that have been used. Intermountain Healthcare, which is in Utah, has 68 primary care clinic sites and they've been on a path over a number of years of bringing each of those sites up to have a full integrated program. And they've got 12 that are considered to be all the way, that they've got fully integrated. When they took a look at the claims analysis and compared the sites with mental health integration compared to those without, 
they found that those with mental health integration demonstrated fewer claims for total primary care and fewer claims for psychiatry in those clinics. At South Central Foundation, which is in Alaska, they have reported a 19% decrease in their ED patients or visits for patients seen by the behavioral health clinician, as well as a reduction in primary care visits. So here's an interesting flip on the connection in the other direction. You give people more access to these services in primary care, they use primary care less. And that's, that's a piece of the equation that we begin to think about when we talk about the business case. My friends, the actuaries, I love actuaries because they really like to look at lots of big data sets. And the folks at Milliman set out to do this study in which they wanted to understand the cost impact of comorbid depression and anxiety on commercially insured patients with chronic medical conditions. So they're looking at the commercial claims database. And what they found is that if you look at the prevalence and the expectation of how many people you would see with depression or anxiety in a population, they were being very much underdiagnosed and therefore undertreated in terms of these two conditions. Their estimate is that comorbid depression with a chronic medical condition results in costs that are higher by $500 per member per month and comorbid anxiety by $651 per member per month. So that's the cost of untreated depression or anxiety in the health system for individuals who have chronic medical conditions. Their estimate is that if we could get a 10% reduction in the costs of healthcare for those patients via an effective integration program, that that would save $5.4 million in health care savings for each 100,000 insured members. And when you roll that all up across the commercially insured population across the country, they estimated that the cost of doing nothing is around $300 billion. Now that's a big number. Uh, that's, that's actuaries really being out there with big numbers. So this, I think, is a very compelling piece of analysis from a well-respected actuarial firm about what the opportunity may be. I think you all probably are aware of the terrific work that Washington State has done uh, here at DSHS in an analysis of the impact of substance use treatment on Medicaid healthcare costs. And one of the things I really like about this study is that they looked at what the impact on health care costs is for those who were receiving treatment, but then further did a differential about what happens if people complete treatment. So if the net offset is $252 a month for being in treatment, it rises to $363 if you've completed treatment. And if you think about folks who have been in methadone maintenance for at least one year, that cost offset went up to $899 per month. The other thing that they were tracking on this was the use of emergency departments. And you can see that in tracking the individuals who had 12 or more visits in a year to emergency departments, again, 17% reduction for those who entered 48% reduction in use of emergency departments for those who did complete treatment. So the pattern that we're seeing here is screening and then integrated care and primary care and then specialty treatment because the substance use study wasn't about integration but it was about specialty treatment and getting people into care, the impact on the reduction of health care costs. Uh, this last one I mentioned the last time but I didn't have the slide in this set the last time, but it's one of my favorite stories from Kaiser, and that is the analysis that they did of the family members of individuals with a substance use condition. Uh, what they saw is that for family members uh, where there's an individual in the family with a substance use condition, they have higher medical costs and they have significantly higher prevalence of medical conditions compared with the control group. And what they found at anywhere between two to five years after the individual went into substance use treatment, if they had been abstinent for at least one year, the family member's health care costs, which had been significantly higher, 
dropped back down and were consistent with the control group. So what that tells us is that in addition to the cost savings that we may be able to look at for individuals, there's the ripple effect of family members that we can be thinking about as we make the case for integrating care. So we have lots of opportunities here. We know that uh, if we tackle some of the care management opportunities that we want to start with the smallest proportion of people who have the highest risk or cost to really focus that intervention and that that can have a huge impact on overall average cost. So if you think back to that first California slide, the 9,500 people with $50,000 a year in cost, that's our target population for designing and delivering care management interventions around whole health of people. We, I think, now pretty clearly know that care management that is either primary care based or mental health substance use provider based promises to be much more effective than telephonic disease management models, which is kind of the trajectory that has brought us to this point. And as I think I mentioned the last time, this is an emerging practice when you're treating individuals in the specialty mental health and substance use system and we have a great deal to learn still. We're, we're, it's been tested in one research trial. We've got projects going on around the country, but we need to learn what will be most effective. And one of the key tools to doing that care management work is data aggregation and prediction tools such as the PRISM system, which you have here in Washington State which is a fabulous tool for being able to look at overall healthcare costs for the population and for individuals. Other assessment tools become very important like the patient activation measure which is used in the ADSA care management project and which is, going, is being used in the four pilots in mental health centers that the transformation grant has funded. And registries for tracking individual status. I'm going to talk more about registries in a little bit, uh, so just keep a hook in your brain so you can go back and hang some more stuff on the registry idea. Um, the key model aspects are important in, in all of this. This is one of the things that we know about implementing evidence-based practices, and it's equally true in thinking about integration, and that is you have to have the right components and you have to have those components working correctly in the right workflows. So one of the things that you will find in your uh, packet today is an attachment from the business case paper that is currently in its final draft form for California. And this summarizes for all of the research uh, that we looked at both the quality outcomes and the healthcare cost impact of each study and what the key model components were of that study. So let me stop and take a few questions about um, business case and then we'll move on. Anybody have any questions or are you just ready to sign up right now? No questions. Should I give you a minute? Monday afternoon, huh? okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's go on to the next piece. So now we're going to talk about the key implementation components of integrated care. And we'll start with the fact that every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. So that means the results we're getting now are the result of the system we've designed to achieve them. And if we want different results, we're going to have to do something different about the system. And the, the piece that leads us in this direction is a, a book that came out in 2001 called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And in that book, which was released by the Institute of Medicine, there was a significant and detailed look at what was wrong with the healthcare system. Now, subsequently, there was another piece of work by the IOM that said, well, does any of that quality chasm stuff relate to mental health and substance use? And a second report that came out 
said, yes, all of it does. Uh, but the initial book laid out uh, both six aims and uh, ten principles that should guide the development of a healthcare delivery system. These are also in your packet, the six aims and the ten rules. And what you'll see in the packet is this picture as well. And what it says to us is that uh, if you think about this as kind of a mini logic model, a very little logic model, that if the outcomes that we want are a healthcare system that is safe, effective, efficient, personalized, timely, and equitable, we're only going to get that if we have high performing patient centered teams that are delivering care. And we'll only get high performing patient centered teams delivering care if they work in organizations that facilitate the work of patient centered teams. And we're only going to get organizations like that if we've got a supportive payment and regulatory environment. Which is why policy is so important to achieving the outcomes we want to achieve. Because the policy environment is where this starts. And if we can line all those things up, then we have a shot at achieving a healthcare system with those kinds of outcomes. Associated with this, then I'd like you to think about the following. Insurance design is not delivery system design. And you shouldn't mistake insurance functions for delivery system functions or assume that the former will create the latter. That if you set up the insurance design in X way, then you know that Y will occur in the delivery system. It means that we need to think about uh, not establishing policy, regulatory, or financing models that are at cross purposes with your desired delivery system. And when Richard is here to speak later this afternoon, you'll hear how they've been grappling with that as they've been thinking about a payment reform model. And in the future, accountable care organizations are going to be one of the places where that mediates some of all of the interaction between insurance design and service delivery design. And we'll talk about ACOs uh, later this afternoon. So, this brings us to thinking about integration and integration in a person-centered healthcare home. One of the things that we know now from a lot of experiments all around the country is that financial integration, we'll just put all the money in the same pot, or operational structural integration, we'll put everybody in the same organization or even under the same roof, Neither of those lead to clinical integration. Neither of them will of themselves create clinical integration. You have to have a clear clinical design and then you need to have your financial organizational structural pieces work to support that. Now what that means if we begin to think about a clinical design, what does that look like? How do we, how do we begin to build that out? We, go back to something we looked at in the last training, which is the description of the patient-centered medical home principles. Continuous care, team-based care, providing all health care or making appropriate referrals, care that's coordinated, integrated, quality and safety, enhanced access. Those are all the characteristics that we want to build into the patient-centered medical home. And this is an update for you from the last time I was here when I showed you the NCQA certification standards for the patient-centered medical home. And since that time, they've released their new draft set of standards and have been taking comments over the last month. And they're substantially revised from the ones that they have had in play for the last two years while all these pilots have been going on. You may recall, if you go back to your office and compare the two slides, the first set was very um, IT heavy, very focused on information technology. This round is much more about person-centered processes of care, those pieces of the delivery system, with the IT being mentioned but as a support to getting this work done. 
So you'll see that now the first standard is about access and continuity, and that has a bunch of components around um, access and how people have access and continuity. It has new material in here about culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Then the second standard is around identification and management of patient populations. And you'll see here, this is the first time you see an asterisk um, italic section, comprehensive health assessment. Everywhere that it's asterisk, there is now a mention of mental health and substance use conditions in the NCQA standards. So what this, for example, is, is telling us is that when they talk about doing a comprehensive health assessment, that includes mental health and substance use conditions. Planning and managing care. In care management, in the care management measure, there's again a mention of mental health and substance use conditions. Self-care process is a standalone standard that doesn't have sub-measures underneath it. And then tracking and coordinating care, um, there's a referral tracking and follow-up makes mention of mental health and substance use referrals. Final one is performance measurement and quality improvement, and they're much more specific now about their expectations for using the data that they collect to improve their own processes of care and improve the quality of care that they're delivering. Their work and the work of the medical home has been grounded in the chronic care model the chronic care model was first developed by Ed Wagner uh, at the McCall Institute here at Group Health Cooperative uh, to look at what, do we, what is it going to take to improve the care for people who have chronic disease conditions like asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And after they researched the literature, they put together this model which says there are these key components that we have to have in place in order to do a better job. So we have to think about how we've organized healthcare. Do we have clinical information systems? Do we have decision support? Do we have a well-designed delivery system? Do we have self-management support built in? And then how do we relate to the community, to the resources and policies of the community? And the intent in this is to say that if you have all of these pieces operating at you know, maximum ability to impact, you will have an informed, activated patient and a prepared, proactive practice team, and you will have much greater likelihood of achieving improved outcomes. This is a version of the same idea, but now for mental health and substance use treatment systems. And it has all of the same key components, except there's one new one that got added. This is work that's been done in California. And so you'll see up here in the um, far corner, they have added a component in the community called social inclusion and opportunity as one of the things that they want to see built into the system to help uh, result in recovery and wellness outcomes. So I'm going to take you through a quick, high-level tour of the key components of the care model because these are the things that are about delivery system design, about being sure you've got all the right pieces in place. And it starts with the organization of healthcare leadership. The experience to date is very clear that if you don't have this as a part of the vision of the organization, if you don't have really a great deal of support from the top, you're not going to be able to create a patient-centered medical home. You're not going to be able to create the kinds of changes that it's going to take. Decision support refers to having evidence-based guidelines in place and working to establish linkages with key specialists, training for staff, and patient education. Very important piece of the role. Delivery system design. Uh, identifying the target population using a registry to proactively review care and plan visits. So let me just stop at this moment because this is the second mention of registry to say that people who work in primary care, particularly in the federally qualified health centers, are pretty familiar with registries, use them to manage all of their patients with diabetes, all of their patients with cardiovascular disease. 
when, uh, when I talk to folks in mental health and substance use agencies about registries, they look at me with kind of glazed eyes, like, what are you talking about? What is this thing called a registry? And when people from mental health agencies go to work in primary care, where registries are being used, including registries for depression, it's a new concept. It's a totally new concept. And one of the things that I think has happened with that concept is that in the mental health system, there's a lot of data collection. You know, you, you do things, you give it to somebody else, they enter the data into the computer so the computer can send the data to somebody else and then they send it to somebody else. It's all this very remote and kind of compliance related view of data. A registry is about using data clinically. And for people who've lived in a data compliance world for much of their careers, it's a really hard shift to make mentally to, oh, this data is going to help me clinically. I'm going to see what's going on on an ongoing trend line with all of the people that I serve. This is the kind of uh, support that we've had in the GAU project as it started in uh, Pierce and uh, King Counties the MHIT system, and I've got a, a screen sh screenshot from that coming up later, so we can come back to registries yet one more time. Clinical information system, establish a registry, and develop processes and use that registry. Self-management, a uh, very big emphasis on using self-management tools and setting and documenting self-management goals collaboratively with patients. So when I think about, for example, the work that, that uh, Candy's group does with uh, care management in the ADSA project, you know, that, that's a big piece of the work, setting and documenting self-management goals collaboratively with patients. That's the process of change that we're looking to support. And then community. Um, we, I think, all know, but I probably better say this out loud just to be sure, there's this thing called the social determinants of health, which is about all the other things that affect our health as individuals. And those things are out in the community. What that means is that housing is important, access to affordable healthy food is important. There's lots of different things that the healthcare system and the mental health and substance use system have no direct ability to affect, but we need to build linkages because that's how we will assure that people actually do have all the supports they need to get healthy. So one of the meanings to me of this particular one is that our partners are public health. The public health departments have got to be our partners in this work because there's a whole piece of work that they do that is about community and social determinants of health. The other thing that this slide speaks to is the kind of supportive services that people need to be able to live effectively in the community. And those are very important to being able to build and, and work with self-management goals. So those are the key components of the care model and its import for us as we think about building a clinical design. This gives you some ideas about what all the pieces are that we have to have in place. Now I want to talk just briefly about the um, Washington State Patient-Centered Medical Home Collaborative. 33 practices across the state both large practices like the Everett Clinic and small practices like a rural health center. And those practices started last September and they are working on transforming themselves into patient-centered medical homes using this set of change package headings. Engaged leadership, quality improvement, patient-centered, organized evidence-based care, continuous team-based care, enhanced access, population management, care coordination you will see all where the correspondences are. It's essentially the care model, pieces of the care model that they're implementing. In your packets, there uh, is a blue handout which summarizes the mission, the goals, and the details of the change package that they are working on implementing. So that becomes important for you to file away because when we hear Richard talk about the performance um, 
payment system that they're getting ready to launch, the sites that are a part of this project are preferred participants for the, the payment reforms that are forthcoming. So if we stand back and look at all of the work that's been done to date about the patient-centered medical home, which is the foundation for the person-centered healthcare home, once we add in the mental health and substance use integrated services, uh, this article just came out in May. It was an analysis of seven medical home projects across the country, and they found four things that were common to all of those um, sites. A dedicated non-physician care coordinator, expanded access, accessible real-time data to manage performance and track patients, and of course, effective incentive pay payments, which is why payment reform is so important. So the um, ex dedicated non-physician care coordinator takes us to having a conversation about care coordination, care management, what is it? So there's been lots of definitions floating around out there, case management, care management, disease management in the healthcare systems. It does seem pretty clear that care coordination and care management are being used interchangeably. But my advice to you as you try to wrap your brain around this is don't pay that much attention to the titles. Pay attention to what the job functions are because that's probably a clearer way to say, okay, what is this piece of work? that we're, um, I'm seeing happening or that I want to design. So let's look at some definitions and think about how care coordination management and case management relate to one another. So care management, um, as defined by Kaiser, includes coordinated health care for logical groupings of members intended to prospectively improve, maintain, or limit the degradation of their functional status. The key takeaway for me from this definition is the logical groupings piece, which means it's population-based. You're saying we're working with a population here. And then we have the National Association of Case Management saying that case management uh, focuses on recovery and self-management of mental illness and life. The individual and practitioner plan, coordinate, monitor, adjust, and advocate for services and supports. That may be a piece of care management as well, but this tends to be more individually based and not as focused on a population. And then we look at uh, an analysis of the ingredients, active ingredients of effective case management when you're looking at an ACT model of mental health services, and the very first bullet says case managers should deliver as much of the service as possible rather than making referrals to multiple formal services. Well, now we know we've just stepped out of care management because care managers are not doing direct service delivery. They're doing all of these other organizing and coordinating functions, but they're not doing direct service delivery. Uh, piece of research to take a look at about um, care management. They call this guided care with a, a nurse. Most of the models have been with nurses doing um, care management. And uh, this was with a caseload of 50 to 60 patients. Comprehensive home assessment, evidence-based care, monitoring and coaching patient monthly, coordinating the efforts of all providers of health care, Managing transitions among sites of care, that's a really important one for care management. Educating or promoting patient self-management and educating and supporting family caregivers. So that fits in with the whole self-management goal setting piece and facilitating access to appropriate community resources. So this model, as tested, resulted in fewer hospital days, fewer SNF days, and fewer ED visits for this group of older adults. Then in the system as it's operated in Washington State, mental health case managers have yet a different role, which is more of a brokering kind of role, obtaining basic supports, crisis prevention, assessment, and outcome-focused service and treatment planning, referral and linkage, engagement, coordinating, and advocacy. So slightly different role yet again. And so when we, when we think about how we take all of this, this history 
of care management, case management, and, and say, what's the work? How is it the same? How is it different? The takeaways for me right now, although we have all, I think, a great deal more to learn about this, is that uh, care coordinators and managers are focused on individuals, but also on populations. So a part of their responsibility is to think about the population they've been assigned to work with, for example, in a practice, a physician's practice as a part of the team, and the functioning of the system, helping make the the system function as effectively as possible for the individual in order to work towards those self-management go goals and a better state of health. And then we have yet one other variation on this theme, which is in Washington State there's also care managers, so that's the title, so you can see why you want to not get confused by the title, um, who have a responsibility within the RSN system. So this comes from the RSN contract. And you'll see when you look at this list of activities that it's much more about what, what might have been called a utilization management or a utilization review set of activities as a form of care management. Which leads me to ask you, what do you think? Case management, care management, how do these pieces fit together? How do we move them forward in a way that makes sense? And let's take some questions and hear some comments. As soon as the mind pieces are falling apart. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your um, discussion this afternoon. I'm Marietta Boba with ADSA. And one of the things that I'm really struck by is how often the word care has been used in this presentation. And I would ask the group, even though I know care is nationally accepted as well as accepted in the state, to really challenge its use. And what we all actually provide are supports and services, not care. And care is also a word of power. And when we talk about patient recipients receiving care, there's a power dynamic mm -hmm. at play that I think that we should really challenge ourselves if we want to really look at cost effectiveness over the upcoming years. The more active a participant is in controlling their own supports and services, the more cost effective and the more savings we'll also see. So I just want to make a pitch to reevaluate how we present it in the future as well as how we implement the model. Great, Thank you. Great comment. Hi, Barbara. Candy Hi. Gehring with uh, ADSA as well. And I was interested in the slide you had up about the change in um, standards from NCQA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually pleased to see the de-emphasis on the actual electronic health record and the technology behind that because that can be a barrier for people and I don't think it has to be a barrier. Um, to be a patient-centered medical home. But I was curious about the self-care process section on that and that there weren't any um, bullet points or detail under that. Do you know if they've developed that or is that uh, in oh, process? No, there is detail underneath it. It's just that they don't have separate sub-measures because under each of these uh, slides, each of these standards are measures. Uh, forgive me while I go Sorry, back Sorry, I think here. it was one of the first ones in this there section. There we go. Yeah. Um, what the way this is set up is that there's detail underneath each one of the subheadings as well. So this is described in much more detail. It's just that there are no separate measures under self-care. It's just all detail, but not oh. with subheadings. So they don't, and I need to go take a look at this and do my homework, but do you know if they have any self-care processes that have been specifically identified to address mental health or, or substance use? There's nothing specific there in mental health or substance use. If there were, I would have put an asterisk there. <laughs> well, we could probably help them with that then. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. This is Jan Norm with the Department of Health. Hi, Jan. I know there's a lot of deliberation about what really does care management mean, care coordination. I mean, you did a nice job of arraying out all the different ways in which it's defined. I think we need to keep in mind that if we ever want to have this service really reimbursed by our care delivery system, our insurance companies, that it is going to 
the imperative that whatever that person does, that they are able to reduce, work toward reducing the overuse and misuse of the system right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we don't attach the functions that that person provides to really looking at are we reducing preventable uh, emergency Avoid, room visits or ED hospital visits. rooms yep. or readmissions, mm -hmm. then we've really missed the boat on what it is mm -hmm. that we want them to do because it's within those areas where we now have misuse and overuse of the system that we're going to be able to capture the funding that will support the costs of providing those kinds of care coordinators for primary care. Absolutely. I would add the third type because, you know, the Institute of Medicine identified three types of problems, overuse, misuse, and underuse. So I think, I think the people that are in these positions also at times will identify where there has been underuse and where more of something is needed as well as less of something else. Uh, I haven't seen that formally called out as clearly as you just said at the closest to it is um, this, no, this one in this particular uh, analysis did not specifically call that out except for coordinate the efforts and smooth transitions. When there's probably stuff embedded in those two bullets that has to do with those kinds of, of assuring that you are addressing avoidable uses. Mm -hmm. That particular study is the guided care model from mm -hmm. Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, quite a bit of literature now that supports this kind of work. Mm -hmm. and they're just one of a number. Right. But I think that it's the care coordination that really is going to help us get to turning that, that uh, pyramid upside down mm -hmm. that you showed at the very beginning. So that, that's really where we're headed. And right. it means that we're going to have to use those folks to help us shift this care so that we're actually putting more resources to the bottom part of the period permit pyramid being prevention and good primary care, inclusive of mental health care. Right, right. And I think in the last session you walked away with a handout of Tom Bodenheimer's work that is uh, one of the, a big mega overview of the, of the literature on care management. Um, let me see, there's somebody else here. Yes, are you in line? I can't quite yeah, tell. I'm in line. Um, I work with uh, in Could DBH. you get closer to the bike? I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I work in uh, DBHR and I work in certification. So I review a lot of the uh, treatment agencies. So the treatment agencies are um, individual agencies and so they're not really in this model. So have you how do we look or what kind of information do we give treatment agencies to look forward to make changes to be able to work within this model so that they stay in business, they understand what quality care is and where they need to move into the future because that's what I'm trying to look at is how do these treatment agencies work in this model? Well, if we go back to the four quadrant model discussion that we had the last time, um, individuals who work in agencies that are mental health and or substance use specialty agencies will have an option in the future of either continuing to be specialty agencies or also trying to do work in primary care settings. And so the, the first thing we need to help people understand is that the continuum just got much broader and I've got some material coming up here that I think will will help sort that out. The conversation is just starting with the treatment community. And this conversation is starting with you all here. There is a meeting that has been scheduled through the Washington Association of Counties for July 21st, at which the session that you all had at the end of last May will be presented to the counties, the human service coordinators, the RSN directors, the public health directors, the uh, substance abuse coordinators, the developmental disability coordinators, all of the health and human services component of counties will be at that training as will representatives from the uh, provider associations. So that conversation is going to be starting in July. Um, at the Washington Behavioral Health Conference, which just took place last week in Yakima, 
there was a beginning series of sessions about this work. So I chaired a session on putting primary care into uh, behavioral health settings, into a mental health center. So it's a starting point. So what was the name of the uh, session that you uh, facilitated in Yakima? Um, my goodness, I'm trying to remember the title. Uh, primary care and behavioral health, can it be done? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? You want to take a break now? Come back in 15 minutes. That's, that would be 20 after 2 by my watch. So Greg, is it working okay now again? Okay. So one of the, the things that fits, fits into this question of how do you support a clinical design? Okay, well, maybe we'll just wait till it gets a little quieter and then we'll try it again. Okay, now, how, can you hear me now in the back row? No? Not well. Greg? So he's checking on it now? Oh, over here they're saying they can't hear. Maybe there's a speaker out, out over there, I don't know. Um, okay, there we go, all right. Actually, that's so loud. Let me move this down a little bit. How, now, how's this? We got the right balance here? Okay. So one of the things that has to be in place to support a clinical design is the ability to share information, which does bring us around to this question of information technology. And while I am also very glad that NCQA has redone their standards so it's not driven by technology, it is also true that you've got to have the information technology to support the work. So there are several pieces here I want to touch on just to be sure that we're all thinking about how that fits into the picture. The first is confidentiality and then the second thing is uh, the various sorts of things that are underway in terms of health information technology. So confidentiality, as integration projects have started around the country, Lots of folks have said, oh, but wait a minute, we can't talk to each other. And um, they say, HIPAA won't let us do this. Well, actually, that's not true. HIPAA supports sharing of information for the purposes of care coordination between the parties. The only exceptions are HIV status and receipt of substance use treatment. Um, so let's take up the substance use treatment one. There is a national uh, pretty active conversation going on right now about whether or not to change 42 CFR Part 2 or the regulations that sit under 42 uh, CFR, which governs the sharing of information regarding substance use treatment. Uh, big conversation in DC, lots of disagreement among parties, but a sense that as we're moving forward with integration, we have to find better ways to assure that whoever is providing care to someone has all of the relevant information in order to do a good job of providing that care. The, the trick, of course, and the concern of the parties who are not wanting to mess with 42 CFR is that in the past, the substance use information that is gathered has been subject to, uh, to subpoena by law enforcement, for example. And so it's, it's like, how do you find the right balance of assuring protection so that people will engage in treatment, but also assuring that anybody who is treating a person has access to that important information and knows all of what is going on. So that's the balancing act that people are working on, and there are various drafts of approaches that have been framed up. Uh, I don't know how it will be resolved. Pam Hyde, who's the SAMHSA administrator, has made a commitment to, to resolving this, to providing some federal leadership to come to a decision about 42 CFR, but it's still an open question at this point. And then when you think about state laws, 
Uh, what happened historically is that many states wrote mental health and substance use confidentiality laws in light of 42 CFR, and even though mental health is not subject to that protection, it has been handled similarly. And I wanted to be sure that you all knew that here in Washington State in 2009, the legislature, in fact, amended state law to make it available to be sharing mental health information for the purposes of care coordination. So it's that same, that same idea that is in HIPAA. That still is going to take some time for it to filter down into the way individuals uh, deliver services because we've got, you know, what, however many years of people saying, I can't talk to you, can't talk to you about that. Now, on to health IT. So the health IT pieces are complex. Uh, and one of the complexities is that while there's been a fair amount of progress within the healthcare system, the general healthcare system, of creating electronic health records, the mental health and substance use systems are really quite far behind the general healthcare system when it comes to adopting electronic health records, in large part because it's not an inexpensive proposition to do that. Um, mental health being further ahead than substance use providers on the whole in adopting EHRs. The High Tech Act, uh, which made possible uh, Medicare and Medicaid incentive payments to providers who adopted EHRs and could prove the meaningful use of those EHRs, does not extend to mental health and substance use providers. So there's now a new piece of legislation in Congress that would extend that opportunity to mental health and substance use providers. That said, there's still uh, a market problem here in terms of what's available on the market. By and large, most electronic health records that have been designed for a healthcare system, a primary care system, for example, don't really have the kinds of fields that would be useful for delivering mental health services or substance use services. And vice versa, most of the products that are available for behavioral health agencies have no field about health status, no place to put blood pressure if you were tracking that regularly for the people that you are giving psych psychotropic medications to. So we also have a problem of the products that are available not really supporting integrated care and the bi-directional gathering of information. Registries are, see I promise you I'd tell you about registries one last time today. Um, registries are also not well supported by any of the products that are out there. You see this last point here that uh, the EPIC system, which is you know, in group health and, and uh, Kaiser's Connect system and the VA system, none of these really support a registry function very well. And that means that in order to run registries, you wind up having to use a side-by-side -side system rather than having it integrated into your EHR. Uh, there's some work that's being done right now in Oregon uh, with the group that provides health IT services for most of the FQHCs in Oregon and a few of the mental health providers. And they've found a piece of software that will suck data out of EPIC and load it into a registry. And that appears to be one of the best products around for doing that. What, of course, this does, if you think about it, then translating this to a clinical setting, is that you wind up having to double enter information. If you've got an electronic health record, you have to put it in the record, health record, you need to put it in the registry. This is not a good workflow thing. You need to find a way around, get this one fixed. Um, in terms of registries, the one, uh, you all can read this in the back of the room, can't you? Uh, <laughs> The one that uh, we have used for the GAU project, MHITS, uh, I've given you this in your handouts, so you can kind of see it a little better, but the main thing I, I want to get back to here with the use of a registry is the fact that it helps you do population management and it helps you track status. 
of the individuals that you're serving. So you'll see in this example that it is tracking the PHQ scores and the GAD7 scores, so depression and anxiety, on an ongoing basis at each encounter so that you can tell over time by just looking at a snapshot on this screen as a care manager, you can look at it and say, oh, you know, I haven't seen Sue, and the last time I saw her, her PHQ is still really high. I need to circle back to her. One of the purposes of a registry is that any clinician, primary care doc, mental health provider, whomever, is focused on the person who's in front of them right now and trying to be responsive to that person and loses track of who else is out there that hasn't come in, that needs to come in because their A1Cs are way out of control and their diabetes is getting worse, not better. It's a tool for that kind of work. Health information exchanges are the, uh, another major player in, um, in the exchange of information because we'll never live in a world in which everybody's on the same electronic health record. That never going to happen at this point. But health information exchanges are a way of taking information from a variety of platforms and pulling it in to a single standardized uh, data warehouse where any of the users can then access the data. Uh, they, it can also support a registry function. It's another advantage of, uh, of using HIEs. Unfortunately, across the country, most of the HIE planning efforts that have been underway have not included mental health and substance use because we've been off in this other silo over here. And um, there's just a couple of exceptions to that. One of them is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, who recently received a large federal grant, and the other one is in King County. So I want to tell you a little bit so that you can begin to see how this might work in a community about King County's partnership for health improvement through shared information, otherwise known as FISI. And FISI is focused on the safety net population in King County. Um, the genesis of this project is that in 2006, United Way convened a group of primary care providers, mental health providers, substance use providers, the jail health system, um, to talk about what they could do to better coordinate care. And what grew out of that conversation was both a description of how the world would work if care was better coordinated and what kind of IT they needed to support that. So the goals that have evolved here are to build a system that is consumer focused, which means you get seamless services, any door can get you connected to what you need that were focused on population health improvement, both reduced morbidity and mortality and system effectiveness, that there's a shared accountability to achieve consumer and population goals. The evolution of this is that as that work group um, that United Way convened made their report in May 2007, they recommended, one of their recommendations was to convene a community forum to talk about shared information. So that forum was in October of 2007. There were about 200 people from across the safety net system in King County that came to the forum to think about what would the world look like if we could more seamlessly share information with one another. That got really a very large vote of support in the community forum. So the following year, beginning in September, King County, uh, both the RSN and the Department of Health, uh, the City of Seattle, United Way, and the University of Washington Harborview got together, convened to actually move the initiative forward. Uh, they convened a larger group then beginning in 2009 when there was a design day and they brought in the community health plan, Molina Group Health, um, and the folks from Bellingham who have been working on the shared care plan and technical experts to talk about where they might go with this design. And a year later, in February of this year, uh, submitted for the federal Beacon grants, grants that were going to go to 15 communities nationally to show how a health information exchange and health IT could change patient care and improve outcomes and reduce costs. Unfortunately, didn't make the first cut, but just reapplied for 
a second cut that might be possible. Tulsa was one of the winning applications, and it's the only other place that seems to have much of a connection to um, the safety net population, to mental health, social service kinds of providers. I want to say a word about the shared care plan as another piece of this. The uh, folks in Bellingham at Peace Health, as a part of a big community project that had an RWJ, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, developed a web-based personal health record that's called the shared care plan. And this web-based personal health record then can be accessed by the person who owns their health care information and anyone else that they choose to give access to that information. Now that the shared care plan sits on Microsoft's Health Vault, it also can be populated by data that's in other systems. So lab feeds, hospital feeds, pharmacy feeds can essentially put all of that data in so you don't have to do it by hand. That uh, shared care plan has been modified to be used for people with serious mental illness and it's currently in a randomized controlled trial in Atlanta with a population from the community mental health system there. And beginning this week, Harborview's Community Mental Health Center is piloting that shared care plan with 50 individuals with serious mental illness that are receiving care in the mental health system. The experience in both of these projects has been that um, the individuals who are participating are tremendously excited about the opportunity to have that information all pulled together for them. It's, it's being seen as a significant way of empowering people to own their own health and uh, to really become engaged in thinking about their self-management goals. So the fizzy population of focus um, was a phased approach starting at the center. So the very center of these concentric circles here are high utilizing adults in the safety net system. And that may be high utilizing is pretty broadly defined, emergency department use, jail health, mental health, substance use services, and high risk complex health conditions. And the estimates, of course, then vary. We don't really know how many people fall into this category. Then it would go out, <coughs> excuse me, to all adults in the safety net system. And that's estimated in King County to be about 227,000 people in a given month. And uh, so it would, it would go out into a larger piece of the safety net system and begin to provide shared information for those individuals. And finally, for all children in the safety net system, that's another 117,000 people in any given month. The intention would be, once it was up and running, is that it would have much of the same information that we now see in the PRISM system, with one major exception, and that is it's real-time data. The way these work is that overnight, they suck in all the most recent information, so the next day you have information that's real time right up to within the last 24 hours, and it includes all of the kinds of things that people say would really make a difference if the information could be exchanged. Uh, key points of contact, last visits, lab values, pharma pharmacy, med lists, a very big wish for people to have is med lists. Um, and the ability to coordinate and give information back and forth. So for example, if somebody was in the emergency department last night and then came into your primary care clinic today, you would be able to check in on that and see what the labs were, what was prescribed, what the intervention was, and you can pick that up seamlessly from there rather than have to reconstitute, figure out what actually happened the last night. So that's the, the FISI project. It has been, it has now reached a point in order to do this Beacon grant application where there is a governance structure in place. There is a, it is in a nonprofit. It's housed in the Foundation for Healthcare Quality and is continuing to move forward with the goal of bringing up both IT but also clinical process changes. So the Beacon application spelled out the clinical process changes that we hope to affect in King County and the IT would be driven by that. So we have ongoing committees working on both of these things right now.